only make this show if we can do it the right way, if we can feel like what we're doing is true to the essence of your father. Hello, and thank you for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 386. Today, I'm joined by Miss Shannon Lee. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and you know what? I love martial arts. I love traditional martial arts of all kinds of them. I trained in a whole bunch of them, trained in a bunch of them still, and, you know, it's, it's the thing I love most in life. So I bring you this show twice a week, and at Whistlekick, we bring you a whole bunch of different stuff. In fact, you can check out everything that we offer at whistlekick.com, and if you check out some of the products we make, whether it's sparring equipment or apparel, uniforms, you can save 15% by using the code PODCAST15. If you want to find the show notes with photos and links and videos and 385 other episodes, you can check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. I suspect that most of you know who Miss Shannon Lee is. Of course, she is the daughter of Bruce Lee. But she's her own person, and she has her own accomplishments, her own goals. And that's why I was really excited to talk to her today. Don't worry. Yes, of course, we do have quite a bit of conversation about her famous father. But it goes a lot further than that, and that was important to me. So, here we go. Miss Lee, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much. It is great to be here. Yeah, well, thank you. It's it's an honor to have you here, and you know we're we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. We're gonna we're going to talk about well, I'm, everybody knows one of the subjects we're going to talk about, but we're also going to talk about some some TV <laughs> stuff that we've got going on. And I want to start this kind of in in a in a way that maybe you haven't started an interview before, because okay, this is a traditional martial arts show. And so everything that we do, everything we talk about on martial arts radio stems from our guest relationship to the martial arts. So okay. I'll ask you the question I've asked many times before. How did you start in the martial arts? Well, I think um, certainly uh, because my father is Bruce Lee, um, martial arts was sort of a a 24-7 happening at my house. Um, So martial arts was always going on. Uh, My father was constantly training. He was teaching um, students in our backyard. He was teaching my brother. He was teaching me to a certain extent, but I was, you know, a toddler. So just some of those basic, like, (laughs) wildly throwing your arms and legs around. (laughs) But um, you know, my father passed away when I was four. And then for many years, I did not train in martial arts. Uh, there was a quick, a quick moment in time when I was about uh, 10, where I uh, trained it with uh, uh, Sifu Richard Bastillo, who was a student of my father's. Um, but that didn't last very long. And then I didn't come back to it again until I was quite a bit older. But then when I came back to it, um, it was because um, I really wanted to make that connection with my father. I really wanted to study his art of Jeet Kune Do and connect with him in that way because this was something that he had created in his lifetime and um, I had not really trained in it except for a few months when I was a kid and so I had become very touched and moved by his um, philosophical writing and I wanted to really connect with him and understand uh, you know this thing that he had created and, and, and what was so meaningful to him in that way and so in my early 20s I started in training Jeet Kune Do initially. And then from there, I trained later with um, Benny Bajet Urquidas in kickboxing for many years. And and I dabbled here and there in some other stuff as well. I did some shoe, I did some Taekwondo, I've done a little Krav Maga, but primarily Jeet Kune Do and kickboxing were, um, were the, the arts that I trained in. Now, any martial artist who's been training for a number of years, you know, at some point we're gonna we're gonna start to think back. We're gonna start back to think back towards towards lineage and 
you know, why? why? Why is this form this way? Why is this technique done this way? And it starts to give us a little bit of context for maybe who those people were. But of course, you had a, a much different, I guess, angle, a much different, I suspect, motivation <laughs> for mm-hmm. your training at that time, especially with, with Jeet Kune Do. Could you speak a little to that? Yeah. And in particular, because as you probably know, Jeet Kune Do is, while it has you know, it's, it's techniques that my father developed. Um, it is an art that is meant to be, be somewhat open, um, open, open to the individual. Um, and so in terms of, you know, where this came from and why it was created, I mean, I certainly know the answer to that as far as my father was concerned. And I think one of the challenges of Jeet Kune Do over these many years since he passed is that it has this very, very strong philosophical component to it. And I think sometimes people become a, a little bit challenged by, um, by the notion of the philosophical component because the philosophical component seems to say like, oh, you can just do anything or you can just combine anything which makes it feel like it's not, you know, an, an, a sort of physical embodied thing. Yet at the same time, um, my father had looked into many different arts. He had got his start in Wing Chun and, um, and trained with Yip Man in Hong Kong for five years as a kid and then gone on to start. Um, from, from that point on, he was, he was self-trained. I mean, he certainly loved to uh, work with people from different arts and understand uh, different uh, forms of Chinese Kung Fu as well as, you know, uh, many of the other arts that are out there. He had a number of students who came from Kempo Karate and and, um, he even had trained in some grappling, some Western boxing. Um, He was very interested in fencing and... um, that came into play in some of the movements of Jeet Kune Do as well. And so, um, but for him, Jeet Kune Do was this notion of like, if I am going to be as simple in form, as direct and efficient as I can be, um, while giving myself sort of the freedom to, to meet every fight, every moment um, in that moment uh, expressly and move how my body needs to move, um, it becomes this thing that is actually, on the one hand, extremely simple, and on the other hand, extremely complex, because Mm -hmm. it requires um, a lot of skill to, to be able to express oneself in that way, a lot of training a lot of understanding of your own body and how your body moves and works most effectively and efficiently. And, and he really believed in, you know, the strong side forward and um, making your most powerful move as quickly as possible and getting out. Now you referenced, of course, your father's writings and yeah. you know, I, I imagine that he was rather prolific. I've, I've read quite a few things and of yeah. course there's no shortage of, of writing that the rest of us get to to read and contemplate and and if you you spend any time on the internet argue about but you had access to everything to things that weren't published and from what i understand it was from some of these unpublished elements that led to the tv show the 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 reason that i get to talk to you today <laughs> um yes definitely i mean um so my father, aside from being a martial artist, he he wrote many, many volumes of of words about martial arts and about his thoughts on martial arts. Um, we have in our archive um, this uh, collection of writings that is seven volumes that he wrote called his Commentaries on the Martial Way, um, from which many books have been published, like the Tao Te Ching and and um, and many others since. But um, he also wrote a lot philosophically about life 
and um, how one should maximize one's potential as a human being and self-actualize and all of that. And he also wrote many creative ideas. He wrote treatments for film and television and, and scripts and, um, and poems and all sorts of things like that as well. And so, yes, um, I, I have had access to all of that. And, you know, this show that we've created is created from one of these treatments that he had written back in the late 60s, early 70s for a TV show idea that he created. And Warner Brothers uh, TV at the time had been talking to him about starring in a TV show. And ultimately that didn't happen because they said a Chinese man cannot um, be the lead of a U.S. TV show. American audiences won't accept that. And so he had created this treatment and it just kind of, became another, you know, um, set of papers within the materials that he created in his lifetime. And it, and it wasn't until sort of the end of 2000 when I stepped in to start running um, um, his legacy and sort of looking after it and all of that, that my mom sent all these materials down to me. And I started going through them and I came across this treatment and I said, oh, here is this treatment that I've always heard about that existed. It's been part of my family's history all these many years. And, and I was like, oh, that's cool. And I read through it and I was like, oh, this is awesome. But I really wasn't in a position at that time to do anything with it. I had a bunch of other things I needed to look after first. And so it kind of just went back in the box and stayed there for a while. And, um, you know, anybody who is sort of a, a large deeper level fan of my father, um, this treatment in this show and, and the fact that he didn't get cast and all that is part of Bruce Lee lore, if you will. And so over the course of many years, um, I had gotten to know Justin Lin a little bit here and there, just running into him, but I didn't know him well. And one day he called me up out of the blue and he said, hey, um, I've always heard this story about this treatment. Is it true? And I said, oh yeah, absolutely it's true and I have the treatment and he was like oh wow can I see it <laughs> <laughs> and so we got together and I showed it to him and he read through it and he was like you know this is really good like it was really well written beautifully typed out eight page treatment really mapping out this show idea and he said we should make this show the way your father intended it to be made and, and thus began our journey to create this TV show. Mm. And of course, you're talking about the show Warrior, which is coming out on Cinemax. And what's what's the debut on that? What's the date? April April 5th. April 5th, 2019, because we might have folks listening to this in, in the future. And of okay. course, one of the things that I am really honored about is that HBO said, hey, Check it out. You you can watch it. So I've I've had the opportunity to watch almost the entire, at least what they sent me. I assume it's the whole first season. And <laughs> I I have I have to say, and and longtime listeners know that, you know, I, I don't I don't just bluntly compliment guests. If if there's nothing nice to say, I won't say anything. But <laughs> nothing else like this show. I've never seen anything yeah. else like this. It it not only embodies the martial arts aspects that you would expect in a show like this. But what I was pleasantly surprised at and, and really enjoying is the, what I expect is the cultural accuracy of the time period and the struggles yeah. of Asian Americans. And maybe you can speak a little bit to that and why that was so important. Yeah, well, that was, um, that, that came from my father, you know, he purposefully, um, Selected this time period. The show takes place in the 1870s in San Francisco, um, primarily in Chinatown. And um, my father picked this time period and this subject matter for a number of reasons. Number one, um, he was very um, interested in telling um, the Chinese stories, and this is a Chinese American story, and it's an American story more broadly as well because it's about you know the whole of of that um culture of san francisco at the time which included um 
the Tong Wars, which was a historical happening in San Francisco, Chinatown at the time, where the, the different families uh, the, in power in Chinatown were warring with one another. Um, it also encompasses a point in time, historically, right before the Chinese Exclusion Act is enacted into history, which was um, a United States immigration policy. And the only time in, in the history of the United States where they targeted one particular race of peoples and banned them from immigration to um, the United States. And, and, and um, this is set sort of like after the gold rush and as the railroads are being finished, being built. And um, there are all these Chinese living here and, and, and they're being used as cheap labor by the industrialists who are trying to build up the city while at the same time the politicians are, you know, trying to, quote unquote, solve the Chinese problem. Um, and they're banning uh, the immigration of Chinese women to the United States so that the Chinese men will not settle down and have families. And it's a very rich uh, and complicated time in our history. And my father chose this because he wanted to highlight these stories. And um, and so, yes, it's a fictional story. And yes, it's an action show. And it's um, hopefully uh, serving well on uh, the action front, um, which is something we strive really hard to do and ha have it have really great action and martial arts sequences. Um, but but it's also a story that that has this sort of rich historical layer to it as well. And and my father also chose this time period because in the old west, you know, um, there were you know pistols and revolvers and stuff, but but, you know, there was more of the opportunity for hand-to-hand -hand comp uh, combat or um, weaponed combat. And, and um, you know, if, if it were to take place in current day, you know, you know, there's nobody running around with semi-automatic weapons blowing people away. And it's, it's a much more visceral time for the clash of all of these cultures. Mm. And I think that that's a great word for it, visceral. There, there's, there's a lot of violence in the show. But unlike there. a lot of shows, the violence is part of the story. Violence tends yeah. to be in, in most of our movies and, and television today, just just a layer. You know, it almost seems to be shock value. And I'm admittedly, yeah. I'm not one for for blood and guts. Doesn't do well mm -hmm. for me. I turn my head. You know, I, I watch a lot of things through through my fingers. But I haven't had that response with this show. And I think that that's because it's it's a necessary part of it. I feel compelled to watch. Yeah despite the blonde guts, because it's part of the story. For sure. And by the way, that was a, that was a big, important part of uh, uh, idea for my father. He did not believe in violence for violence sake, you know, just to, to shock you or to, you know, make you feel something or wince or whatever. He believed in, you know, the combat happening because it was, part of the story it was part of the story of the characters and part of what you know was going down between the different um characters and factions and so we definitely held to that and the fights are they're they're emotional also like there's there's a lot at stake for everybody and and it's and it was a very violent violent time i mean the the um Tongs of the time period had in their employ these men called hatchet men who carried around these short handled hatchets and would, you know, uh, chop each other with them, <laughs> chop each other up and bludgeon one another with them. And, and so even in our story, not everybody is a martial artist. Some people are just, you know, brutally defending or carrying out their job as a sign, as it were. And so while the show has a lot of quote unquote violence in it, it's all, as you say, you know, very intricately woven into the fabric of the story. Well, now, of course, in the notes that I was sent, I was asked to make sure that I ask you about your role, in the show, <laughs> which tells me that maybe you had a little bit more to do with it than, than we might expect. 
Well, I am one of the executive producers on the show. Um, myself, Justin Lin, and Jonathan Tropper um, are the ones who really came together and and created the show. I mean, Jonathan is the writer, and he did a, a beautiful writer and showrunner, and he did a beautiful job really um, collaborating with myself and Justin to create this um, this world and, and listen carefully to what was important to us because, you know, the thing that I really valued in Justin as a partner was he said, we shouldn't just make this show to make the show. We should only make this show if we can do it the right way, if we can feel like what we're doing is true to the essence of your father. And so, yes, the show is updated and contemporized for the viewing audiences of today because, you know, 1970s episodic TV was a very different thing from the way stories are told in, in television today. But but that essential quality where we're talking about like these authentic portrayals and stories and where the, the characters are really, you know, complex and full fledged and we have this beautiful cast of, and this amazingly talented Asian cast and, you know, getting to cast it the way we wanted, getting to um, tell the story the way we wanted. Um, it was a collaborative effort. You know, I read all the scripts. I gave all the notes. I gave all the notes on all the cuts and everything. And there were times when, you know, we do a lot of fun little nods to, to some Bruce Lee uh, stuff throughout the show, even though technically Bruce Lee is not in the show. It came from his creative mind and it's fun for us to drop some little Easter eggs in here and there. If you're a big fan, then you'll be able to find them. But even at times I was like, it's too much. And we got to let's pull it back. <laughs> We're doing, trying to like drop in a little too much here. Or I really had a hand in making sure that the women came off as powerful within their own worlds that they operated in. I didn't want them to just be side pieces to the men in the show. And so there was a lot of making sure it stayed within the legacy. And then also that it, that it, it was a show of, of, you know, as much depth as, as we could put into it was uh, important to me. Mm. And it, it really seems like it came through in that way. And, you know, maybe it didn't happen this way, but I just, I, I imagine, I have this imagination that as, as you and the others were sitting down and, and just batting around these ideas and how to implement, you know, cause eight, eight pages doesn't become an entire no. show. I mean, there's, there's a lot. Anybody that's ever written a script or read a script knows that there's a there are a lot of pages that go even into a half hour of television programming, and this is an oh, hour yeah. long show. There there's a there there was a lot that had to happen, but in my mind, I suspect that not just for you, but for most, if not everyone involved, Bruce Lee was kind of there, right? In 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 mind, is that is that for fair? sure? Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair to share to say. And also, I mean, this may this may sound a little like out there, but but honestly, I, to a certain extent, I really feel like he was his energy was guiding the process because whether that was coming through me or whether it was coming through um, other people's sort of um, respect for him as well, I have to say that um, there were moments in time where I had sort of these like pullback moments when we were really starting to break the story and, and create the world where I would sort of step back and feel like really energized. And I would go, Oh, okay. Yeah, this is good. This is, this is coming together. This, this, this is going to be good. And then like just with everybody with the cast signing on and, and the production um, crew coming together, everybody seemed just, so excited um, and so energized um, to be doing this show and um, that, that there was almost this like kinetic energy that sort of sparkled through the, the whole thing. And, and we had people come in like Brett Chan, who's our fight coordinator, um, usually doesn't work at this level budget wise, but he was so into the concept of the show and, and the fact that we were bringing this story of my father's to life, that he was like, I'm in, just, just tell me what to do, you know, like, what do you want me to do? I'm here. So 
there was so much goodwill and so much good energy. And I just have to feel like, you know, my father was sort of sending us some of his, uh, some of his love in that regard. Mm. Now, as you might imagine, this being a martial arts show, specifically a traditional martial arts show, your father's name's brought up almost every episode. And it's, it's amazing <laughs> that here we are more than 40 years yeah. after his passing, and he's not only one of, if not the most influential martial artists of all time, but he's still the most iconic. And I'm wondering if that's a difficult shadow to live in. Is that is that well, empowering for you yeah. or is that difficult or or both? It's definitely it's definitely both. I mean, I think one of the things I've said in my life is I'm always in relationship to what that means for me, right? Mm -hmm. And um I think that um it would be ridiculous for me to say that it was anything but an absolute honor and a privilege to be the daughter of Bruce Lee. The sort of love and inspiration and energy and good feelings that he has put into the world um, and that I have experienced through coming into contact with so many people who have gotten that from him is nothing but beautiful. Um, and at the same time, being a human <laughs> and having to come into my own and understand my own identity. And in, and in particular, like, you know, I think like my brother and I, we both didn't, um, we didn't engage in martial arts as kids after our father died because it, I think it felt just a little overwhelming, you know, like, like stepping into, you know, a school would be a little bit like all eyes on, on us sort sure, of thing. And sure. so it took time for both of us to kind of like grow into ourselves a little bit to go like, no, this is important and we want to train. Um, and, and still as a human, you know, you tend to get in your head, especially when you're younger about like feeling like you have big shoes to fill or feeling like you have to, you know, make your own way or, you know, all of this kind of stuff, feeling a little bit uh, at times like, oh, you, I, I shouldn't tell anybody who I am. And then sometimes feeling like, why am I keeping this a secret? Like, I'm proud of who I am. And, you know, and, and being just in constant relationship with how does this, what does this mean for me in, in a weird sense? Because there's no possible way for my for me to separate myself from it. And in a lot of ways, it has absolutely nothing to do with who I am as a human being. And yet it does, right? So <laughs> undoubtedly, because there, <laughs> because there is this legacy that, that is beautiful and rich and has inspired me as well. And so, you know, the reason I got involved in, in um, being the steward of my father's legacy and keeping it alive um, as as best I can and amplifying it as best I can is specifically because it is meaningful to me uh, on a personal level. Uh, his words have um, helped me grow um, and helped me heal in many ways. And um, I, I just know that um, people need to know also that that side of him more as a philosopher and as a person who lived his life um, in a particular way. And I want people to know that. And so um, aside from uh, the fact that he was an amazing martial artist, he was an amazing human. And I just want people to, to come into contact with that idea and understand what there is for them in the legacy of Bruce Lee, even if they're not martial artists. So you know, it's an ongoing thing, but I have to say my father's philosophy really says it all, right? Which is that, um, you know, I'm not in this world to live up to anybody else's notion of who I am, you know, and uh, I'm only need to live up to that for myself. And I should really only actualize myself and not myself as the image of whatever someone thinks Bruce Lee's daughter is, right? Mm. Of course, absolutely, and and while the 
the challenge of that might be a little larger, a little more public for you. I think it's something that we all face. Yeah. Is trying to step out on our own and understand what our lives look like, not just despite and because of our parents' influence, but you know, how how do we how do we form that path anew after that guidance? Totally. I mean, this is the human experience. My experience is no no different really than anyone else's, you know? Like, um, yes, sometimes there's a little bit more public scrutiny around it and, and people have, you know, a, like strangers have opinions about it. <laughs> I <laughs> can only like... imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's been, you know, all these years of, of like, personal self-growth and personal maturation um, to develop this sort of immovable center that, that is Shannon Lee that can move through the world um, with some sense of, um, you know, just rooted beingness, which everybody uh, can have, should work on, should develop, um, that sort of safe harbor within themselves and that sense of, of um, you know, just being able to express you mm. because, because you've done the work to know who you are, right? Yeah. So everybody's journey is the same in that regard. <laughs> it is. It is. Now, I'm, I'm curious because I, I, I'm sure you have a ton of stories and I'm wondering if you might indulge us you you mentioned strangers having opinions on maybe the way <laughs> that you should be doing things and anytime you know we've had I, I i believe you spoke with him for the book uh matthew Polly did a, a wonderful mm-hmm. biography on your father um and of course the moment that, that that episode that conversation aired you know it just especially on youtube right because youtube is just the 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 cesspool of of human comments <laughs> It's, it's disgusting <laughs> at times the way people will 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 speak and and treat each other. Is there a particular anecdote that you might share when you when you say strangers have opinions on the way things should be done? <laughs> uh sure. Um, well, um, I've had a, a lot of experiences. I've I've had people tell me um that um i i need to have more children um i have one daughter um who is an amazing being of her own and i've had people tell me i need to have a boy because if i don't have a boy um that would be letting the legacy down um so i've i've had that (laughs) um when I first started acting, um, I had not, you know, acting was something. So my brother loves acting for acting's sake. And uh, I love acting for acting's sake. I have a fine arts degree in music. And so I, I performed a lot of the time um, musically in college. And, but I always loved like just performance and creativity and all that. And, my brother got into acting because he wanted, he knew he wanted to be an actor from the time he was a small child. And, and he loved acting. And as Bruce Lee's son, you know, people were like, oh, you have to do martial arts projects. And while he had trained in martial arts, um, it, it wasn't, you know, that wasn't like his love. He didn't want to just do martial arts film, but there was nothing else he could get. You know, and so similarly, when I started acting, it was the same. You know, I had not been training in martial arts very long at that point. And and they were like, oh, well, you're Bruce Lee's daughter, so you have to be in these action (laughs) shows. And I was kind of like, uh, okay, well, but that's not really what I want to do. But I couldn't get any other parts. And I remember, gosh, I can't even remember. I was doing some, some, show or film or something and somebody took out a full page ad in was either the daily variety or the hollywood reporter against me saying i was a fraud and and that i should never be allowed to 
be on TV. And, and I was like, wow. <laughs> Um, you know, and as a young person, I was very hurtful and, and my brother had just died and I was in a very tender place. And so, you know, I, I, you know, people have opinions, I suppose, but, um, it was, uh, there, there are a lot of things like that. I've had people tell me that because I'm a woman, I'm not smart enough to run my business and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I don't know if I'm happy or sad that that you've had a similar experience to so many others. Well, I mean, look, this is just the world, right? And yeah. and whether whether you've had this everybody's had experiences like this, whether it's on a bigger stage or a smaller stage, like everybody's had this sense as people just like getting all up in their business and deciding what's best, right? People are judgmental by nature. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, the thing is, is that it is our journey as humans to um, try not to get tangled up in that and try not to also get sucked into the um, emotion of all of that and to just sort of stay true to who we are and doing our work while at the same time we need to do the same with with others like like you know we can't get down in we can't follow that like if we don't want other people judging us we can't judge them either right we have to kind of focus on ourselves focus on creating this sense of harmony amongst the humans in our lives as opposed to a sense of competition or a sense of needing to beat somebody else down and so all we can do is sort of work on ourselves, focus on ourselves, um, be kind, be compassionate, um, understand that other people are going to do things differently than you are, and, and let them have their own process. Um, but this is the same for everybody, you know, and, and I have to say my father's philosophy really, really speaks to this. It's like when he talks about empty your mind, the first part of the be like water quote you know, he's saying like, don't sit in, don't come in with any preconceived notion. Don't come in with a judgment. Don't come in with an idea of what's right or wrong. Just come in empty and ready and open to receive, to perceive whatever is actually going on in the moment, you know? Wonderful advice, powerful advice, and not always the easiest to follow, but well, are, that's what are. the training is for, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Now, if folks want to learn more about the show, Warrior, if they want to follow you or, or the show or any, any of the relevant things online, you know, give us the websites, give us the social media so we can yeah, check all that so, out. Yeah, thanks. So Warrior is um, on Cinemax. Um, you, can, uh, you can go to Cinemax's site. Um, you can also find out about it from our site, which is uh, brucelee.com or all our social media handles, which are at Bruce Lee um, on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. Um, it debuts April 5th um, at 10 p.m. Um, our foundation is bruceleefoundation.org. If you want to see what we're doing on the charitable side and the programs we're running, um, I have a book coming out um, in January of 2020 called Be Water, My Friend, that is um, about my father's philosophy and how to use it in your daily life um, and telling some of the stories of his life and my life. And um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. Um, can, you can follow the show. I know there's a, a hashtag of Warrior Max. So if you're trying to find like the relevant posts. There's some mm -hmm. really great actually um, little docu-series shorts that have been released about the making of Warrior oh, and cool. interviewing yeah, some of the cast and all that. So there's lots to, lots to find. Good, good. And of course, we'll link all of that in our show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com in case someone's on a treadmill or driving. No need to jot that down. I really, <laughs> really appreciate you being here today. And you may not know this, but we send every show out in kind of the same way. We ask our guests 
what parting words would you leave the listeners with today? Ooh, okay. Well, hmm. so one of my favorite quotes of my father's, the one that sort of like really first woke me up when I was in a kind of dark place of, you know, grief and, and trying to figure my life out. <laughs> <laughs> And which is a, a little lesser known quote of his, and um, and the, the whole quote itself is, is is long, but the very first phrase is the one that really sort of touched me is um, this one, which is the medicine for my suffering I had within me from the very beginning. So look within, find the medicine. <laughs> That's what I would say. I know how difficult it can be to follow in the footsteps of others, but I have to admit, I have no idea what it's like to be someone who has trained in the martial arts as Bruce Lee's child. When your father is the most famous martial artist of all time, that carries weight. And I have to say, it really seems like Miss Lee shoulders that well and has used it in positive ways as much as any of us could ever hope to. Thank you for coming on the show today. Of course, we have photos and other stuff related to the upcoming release of The Warrior Show over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Don't forget, we've got links and a bunch of other stuff over there as well. And you can check out all the other episodes. Now, if it's the products you're after, whistlekick.com, use the code PODCAST15. And we do have quite a bit of that stuff over on Amazon. No discount code there, though. I'd appreciate any help you could offer us, whether that's with a purchase, sharing an episode, leaving a review somewhere, just something. Let us know that you appreciate the show and everything that we're doing here at Whistlekick. If you want to follow us, we're at Whistlekick on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. My personal email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and I would love to hear your feedback to this or any other episode. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 